there'll be serious commercial, you know, economic consequences because Asia is integrating very rapidly. They're signing lots of trade agreements with each other. Asians trade more with each other than they do with Europe or with America. So if we launch these trade wars, then we wind up cutting ourselves off from their trade with each other because that's going to happen. And that's going to mean that our multinational companies are going to have lower revenues. You know, their, their, um, their share prices, their valuations, their market cap are going to fall. So that, that's one very significant consequence of having the wrong policy towards Asia, which is presently what we do have. But again, when I say we, I really only mean Trump's America. You know, I don't mean yeah. Canada. I don't mean the West. Because one of the things that I uh, explain in great detail and length in the book is Europe's attitude towards Asia is very different. Europe is embracing these new Silk Roads. Europe wants the Belt and Road Initiative to flourish. Europe wants have high-speed railways connecting you know, Britain and Germany all the way to China, because they're the ones who are exporting even more to Asia than we are. So it's critical to realize that we should open our eyes and to see what others are doing more successfully and to learn from them before it's too late. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better, where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. And hey, welcome back to Think Bigger, Think Better. And today it gives me great pleasure to welcome back Parag Khanna to talk about his new book, The Future is Asian. Before chatting to Parag, let me draw attention to our two previous episodes. One is on plastics in the ocean, which is very scary. And one is on evolutionary biology that seeks answers to the question, are we humans still evolving and in which direction? And following this episode, we will have an interview with one of today's experts on behavioral science, Kelly Monaghan. I describe behavioral science as the new black in business. Why are businesses going gaga for behavioral science? What does it do? Where do we see it? And what are the advantages? And after that, we're going to have another episode on the environment, this time on straws. Did you know that we dispose of enough straws per day to circle the earth 2.5 times? Do we really need all those straws? What are the costs of all that? I also want to give a shout out to my four newest Patreon subscribers. It means so much to me that you support this podcast. Really, really thank you. So thank you to Karen Deal, Arian Overwater, Rhonda St. Croix, and Stein Christensen. Thank you. I'm going to be sending you a free copy of one of my books, a free chapter of another book, and for patrons in the $5 category, an invitation to join a recording with one of my guests. And finally, on an exciting note, I'm nearing completion of my book, Behaviors and Influence. It will certainly be the best writing I've ever done. If you want early releases of that, join my mailing list at paulgibbons.net. So on to today's show. In the 19th century, the world was Europeanized. In the 20th century, it was Americanized. And now in the 21st century, the world is being Asianized. Well, what does that mean? And is it true? According to our guest, Parag Khanna, the Asian century is even bigger than you think. Far greater than just China, the new Asian system taking shape is a multi-civilizational order spanning Saudi Arabia to Japan and Russia to Australia, linking 5 billion people through trade, finance, and infrastructure networks that represent 40% today of global GDP. And as, of course, you know, that percentage is growing dramatically. Parag, our guest, is an author of a trilogy of books on the future of world order, beginning with the second world, Empires and Influence in the New Global Order. In 2008, Parag was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century and featured in Wired magazine's Smart List. He's been an advisor to the U.S. National Intelligence Council's Global Trends 2030 program. From 2013 to 2018, he was a senior research fellow at the Center on Asian Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. And from 2006 to 2015, he was a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation. He's a CNN global contributor. His 2008 cover story for the New York Times, Waving Goodbye to Hegemony, was one of the most globally detailed and influential. He also appears frequently in media around the world, CNN, BBC, CNBC, Al Jazeera, and other broadcasters. His TED Talks have been viewed several million times. So let's welcome Parag for round two with Parag Khanna. Parag, welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better. You know, funny, you're my first repeat offender. 
Is that right? Oh, I'm honored, deeply honored. Yeah, well, you uh, seem to be able to produce a book uh, about every nine months or so these days. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I like to say it's the closest thing a man can come to having a baby, after all, <laughs> is the labor, the labor involved in, uh, in doing a book. Yeah, and I, I and I guess you're, you're. What did you say? A lecture a day keeps the doctor away. So you're you're working. There is that, now. especially when you're on book tour, indeed. So um, you were just at Davos. Um, do you mind sharing with listeners some of what you found surprising or interesting or or unusual about Davos this year? I guess it's. I guess you're a repeat offender there. You go most years, don't you? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I have lost count, so uh, no point in you know. It's it's more than ten and less than twenty. But uh, you know, this year was perhaps so unremarkable at some level because there was a certain banality and predictability to the fact that you had lame duck kind of Western leaders, the Macrons and Merkel types, you know, Trump didn't even come, Theresa May didn't come. You had kind of populist firebrands who, again, you know, their curiosities more than they are strategically significant people like Bolisario, Brazil, you know, so it wasn't really in that sense interesting, you know, at this point, there, and also, I think for me, the big divide was, and it's obviously a big theme of this book as well, kind of East and West, you know, where you know, populist politics of Western societies and the gloominess about slow growth versus everyone else, you know, coming from Asia, Africa and elsewhere that's really focused on globalization, trade, moving up the value chain, you know, high growth rates and, and so forth. So, you know, even though people accuse Davos of being like a filter bubble, you know, and, and much worse, of course, as well, it's actually internally quite bifurcated as well, at least bifurcated, if not trifurcated into different kind of, you know, communities that have different things on their minds and different um, kind of sentiments. And so what preoccupied, what were the different preoccupations, would you say, of the East and West from your point of view at Davos? Um, West, because I think it's an interesting topic, is the notion that there is no unified West. You know, Canada right. is not that much like America these days. You know, I mean, oh. Canadians yes, are yes, much yes. more like Western Europeans, whereas there is this Anglo-American, you know, in other words, America and the uh, United Kingdom. Yeah our populist politics, you know, driving ourselves into an abyss, you know, sort of uh, uh, it, that is a particular predicament or malady right now. And it's not global. People talk about populism, protectionism, xenophobia, you fill in the blank as if it's afflicting the whole world. It's really just us. You know, we are the dumb ones. You know, that's us, funny. And it's really I, easy. It's really easy to see ourselves as being paradigmatic. But in fact, we don't in fact, often enough, see ourselves as being is an American exceptionalism in a different way, right? We refuse to see ourselves as exceptional in this in this respect. Exactly right. And, you know, this is an area in which you don't want to be exceptional. You don't want to be exceptionally dumb. <laughs> you don't want to have, right. you know, sort of uh, backwards looking politics that's self-destructive, right? While much of the world is going in another direction. And again, that's part of what motivated me to write this book, because I moved to Asia a few years ago. Um, living in Singapore, traveling around the region. And I see so much as just the opposite of what our problems are. You know, the optimism, the openness, the pro-globalization sentiment, you know, all of that is how you would characterize Asia today. So it's been a real eye-opening experience to go live there and to travel around all the countries in the region. Uh, I bet it has. I bet it has. I mean, even though you're you're a a Asian by uh, you know origins very far back, you're you're Swiss. Are you Swiss Swiss national or German national? I can't recall. No, no, no. I mean, I did spend time in Germany growing up, but I, uh, you know, we moved to America when I was about six. So you know, I've been I basically become a New Yorker as much as anything. One God of help the uh, <laughs> yeah, one of the threads. Yeah, one of the threads in in the book is the notion of how I grew up as an Asian American, which is of course the term for people like me, you know, who are like ethnically Asian, but growing up and assimilating in America, you're an Asian American. But now I call myself an American Asian, an American who's going in, back to Asia and trying to fit in in Asia, the place he's supposed to be from. And right. uh, that term didn't exist. I, I coined it, and it's it's in the book. Oh. Uh, so it's cool. sort of. And if you think about it, it's not a term we ever thought we would need because you never thought that people would ever go back to the East or go back to Asia. I mean, you know, these poor, feudal, agrarian, you know, socialist backwards countries, why would anyone go back? But now you look at them today and they've got the smart cities and the financial centers and the innovation and the seamless, you know, high quality of life and all this kind of stuff uh, is what you're starting to see in Asia. So a lot has changed in the last one generation. I sort of understand your 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 predicament. I, I grew up in the United States, but moved to Europe. So I was always an American living in Europe, 
it confers certain benefits and also you know you you're you're always you know sort of culturally an outsider to some extent and then uh, i moved back uh, a dozen years ago to the united states and so i very much i've been here 30 years so considering myself very much identity wise a european and now i'm back in the united states with an american accent and of course but uh european values so I, again i'm no longer really you know at home it's a particular weird thing they, there's an expression it, i think you can never yeah. go home. you can yeah, never go it's home. interesting you say i don't hear many people so candidly say that they subscribe to European values, even if you're not European, because it's very uncommon to have that kind of awareness of how different the value systems are in the West. And and for me, I totally agree with you, because from the time that I lived in Germany growing up and multiple times that I've lived there, I've definitely picked up the certain European values as well. And, um, you know, there's a clear distinction, really, like I said before, between the kind of Anglo-American way of running a country and an economy versus the continental European way. And those of us who have lived in, um, you know, a, a place like like a Germany or, or Switzerland, certainly um, it, it sticks with you. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, I haven't spent enough time in Asia. I'd love to hear more about the book. Congratulations on which, what number book is this? This is your sixth book or something like that? So something Counting. like that? <laughs> I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I'm accurately counting, though. That's the thing. You are. You are indeed. All right. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about the future of Asian. I guess quickly. I just begin with what's your motivation? Why write it? Why, of all of the topics, you know, you're a, a polymath uh, and and polycultural and and polyglot and poly lots of things. So you, you could have written a lot of books. Why this one? Well, I think you know this one was just. Well, there's two reasons. You know, one is when I write a book, there's an itch that I want to scratch, you know, and, uh, and that's usually an intellectual bone to pick or an argument or a disagreement with the mainstream. So that was certainly Otherwise, why write it, right? Exactly. Why, oh, and, yeah, uh, why, why live in the echo chamber and say what everybody yeah, else is saying? Exactly. Yeah. So there needs to be this sense that, you know what, when I'm reading about Asia is incorrect, it needs to be fixed and I'm not going to sleep well, you know, until I've done so. And that was certainly the case here because we've had, you know, 20 years of books about Asia. However, they're all actually about China. They're not really about Asia. You know, ah. and China is part of Asia and it's an important part of Asia, uh, but it isn't all of Asia itself. You know, there's three and a half billion people in Asia who are not Chinese. That's an obvious fact. Uh, it's so blindingly obvious that, you know, it's almost frightening that I have to say it. And yet when I say it, it bowls people over. So now is the time to start to understand that Asia is much bigger than China especially with the Chinese economy slowing and other economies rising quickly and corporate America looking for new sources of growth as China does slow. Um, it's like, hello, everyone. There's another several billion Asian citizens and customers that are younger, uh, you know, very dynamic societies, fast growing. So that's one reason why that I wrote the book. And the other is, you know, also you know, personal, cultural, you might say, again, as I said, moving back there and living there and experiencing the vibe really has had a powerful uh, impact on me. And in that sense, this book is, is not new. There's a lot of continuity. You know, with, with my books, one picks up where the other is left off in yes. observing how the world changes over time and what the biggest change is at any given time, you know, is going to be kind of my subject of interest. And I'll try and take a, both a top down and a bottom up. I got it. And, you know, it's funny, I have to confess. You know, when I, when I saw, yeah. Yeah. When I saw the futures of Asian, I did think China. So I'm uh, steeped in the same ignorance as the rest of us. In some respect, the same paradigm as the rest of us. So, so talk us through some of the some of the points in the book, if you will. Some of the economic. I guess it's economic and cultural. Very much economic and cultural, as far as it's I. It's very say. very geopolitical, you know. But geopolitics encompasses everything else as well. You know, it's it's national willpower and cultural confidence, but it's also macroeconomics and trade integration. It's all of those things. So, and um, you know, very importantly, it's also history. So what I one of the chapters of this book retells the history of the world in a mere 50 pages, but from the point of view of a kind of average Asian or a kind of melange of an Asian, you know, what's the sort of a a blend of yeah, Yeah. a a composite of Indian, Chinese, Persian, Southeast Asian, Japanese, you know, how would they view the world? And that was, by the way, the hardest chapter of any book I've ever had to write to try to sum up. You know, I mean, really all of human history (laughs) from the Asian point of view. And it was extremely rewarding because, again, having grown up in the U.S., these are things that I didn't learn in history class. And I'm very disappointed in my history teachers. Tisk, tisk, you know, shame on them for not teaching me global history the way it should be taught. And there is a, a nascent field called global history. And, um, you know, what I've tried to do is to contribute to that tradition 
in the way I've structured that narrative. So it, you've got the history, the economics, the geopolitics, and culture is a very strong part of this book because there is what I call the new Asian values, you know, a new set of, uh, of you know, kind of guiding principles that a lot of Asian societies follow, whether they are democratic or authoritarian, you know, Chinese or, or Indian. And that was a really interesting exercise to do as well, to put myself into the position and say, you know, what would a Filipino and an Iranian and a Russian and a Kazakh and an Indonesian agree upon when it comes to how their country should be run? And believe it or not, I, I, t- I took a stab at that, you know, and I took a stab at that. And the feedback has been really, really positive. And that's interesting because it's often said that Japan is the most Western of all the Western countries. Uh, and so, but that would be part of your melange, wouldn't it? Uh, would ja- or is Japan an outlier from your perspective? No, absolutely not. Japan is not only very Asian, but Japan is an icon of Asia. It ranks today, as we sit here, as the most uh, popular and the most respected country in Asia. Uh, Japan is the reason that we have this Asian growth story today, because right. it was the Japanese economic miracle of the post-war decades of the 50s and 60s yeah. that made it the second largest economy in the world. And it was Japan's story that inspired the next wave of countries, the tiger economies, South Korea and Taiwan and so forth. And then mm. those countries together with Japan have been the largest investors in China over the last 40 years. Right. So it's extremely so important. Part of the for China growth to story is part of the tiger growth story as well. Yeah, exactly. So, so China is not some island hovering above Asia, right? The way Trump would talk about it. China yeah. is deeply embedded in the Asian story. So what values would you say, you know, unite these? I mean, you know, you talk about the Kazakhs and the Japanese and the Iranians and the, uh, the Indians and the Chinese in the same breath. So what, you know, what, what do they share values wise? It's a great question. So the first is what I call, uh, well, well, it's mixed capitalism, right? This is a simple one for everyone to understand. I mean, the government plays a strong role in the economy. You know, there is an intervention or subsidies, industrial policy, all of those kinds of things. Uh, no question about it. The other is technocratic governance. And what I mean there is that, you know, there is a preference almost for a strong executive leader. It doesn't have to be an autocrat, you know, it can be someone who's elected. Um, you know, Asia, as I point out in the book, is home to more to people living in democracy than any other part of the world. In fact, there are yeah. more Asians living in democracies than the rest of the world put together. And But again, when we often talk about Asia, we assume that some monolithic authoritarian threat emanating yeah. from China. But there's 2 billion people living in democracies in Asia, 2 billion. And in fact, uh, most of them are going having elections in the next six months. So it's going to be a very exciting uh, time. Yeah, actually. Interesting. Yes. And by a technocratic, yep. for people who didn't read your first book, what would you, how do you characterize a technocratic society or technocratic leadership? So technocratic leadership is, you know, selected meritocratically. It has a long-term vision of national, you know, progress and modernization. The people trust the leader to make those long-term decisions. You know, and again, you have a lot of that in Asia, even if they're elected uh, or, or unelected, but you have a trust for the civil service, you know, educated elite thrown out the window. Uh, here in the in the U.S. and U.K. And the third is what I call social conservatism. You know, they have a very cautious and incremental approach to liberalism. You know, they have a, they they're they're cautious about gay rights or abolishing the death penalty or reducing media censorship. Now, some of these things are not good. We wouldn't look at that and say it's oh that's a good thing. You know, censorship is not a good thing. But when you spend time over here in Asia, you know, you get a sense of why they have this cautious approach. And sometimes it has positive consequences. So if you look at social media, right, we now have politicians and citizens screaming fire in a crowded theater every day, you know, inciting, you know, hatred and and, and racial tension all over the place. You cannot get away with that in an Asian country where they're so ethnically diverse. You just can't, you know, you'll go to jail. And I think people are realizing now, you know what, maybe we need to be a bit tougher. You know, we should not be curbing free speech. But we should be, you know, in a way, policing fake news a lot more stringently than we do. And again, we're waking up to the negative consequences of that. In Asia, they have zero tolerance for it. And now that they've watched everything that's happened with our election and Trump and fake news and and filter bubbles, they are forcing Facebook and Google and Twitter and WhatsApp to hire monitors to see that if there's fake news and lies, you know, that are spreading virally, it has to be stopped and shut down immediately before people get killed, you know, and again, you, you think about it and you say, you know what, that's not such a bad idea. So there are aspects of this social conservatism in Asia that's quite prevalent that are definitely worrying, 
And then there's aspects of it that are actually that we could learn from. If you'll permit me a 10 second commercial break, Think Bigger, Think Better survives only because of the goodwill and support of its Patreon subscribers. So if you're loving the show, head over to patreon.com Paul Givens and hit that become a patron button. For as little as $2 a month, you get extra content, free content, can listen into recordings and get free books. So thank you very much for your support and back to our show. So what's happening economically? I think I just wrote a, um, I've just, in fact, it's probably about to come out in the next few days. I, I did a little, a little short study on China. China's growth has fallen to 6.6%, I think, in the fourth quarter of 2018. And they're terribly disappointed with that. The United States, I don't think, has had a growth quarter that strong since the 50s. I think 1955, it had 8% growth. So, you know, uh, forgive me if I, I'm out by, by a few years or so on that. So that's an incredible story that uh, they are disappointed by the kind of growth that, that the United States hasn't seen in 70 years. So what's what's happening in the rest? I mean, the, the China story is often told. What's happening in the rest of the region uh, from your point of view economically? Right. And, you know, because Chinese numbers are not necessarily all that trustworthy, you know, and we know that they're slowing. And but we also know that the economy is so huge that even 5% growth in China is still adding several hundred billion dollars a year to the world economy. So it's nothing to sneeze at. But remember that India is growing faster than China already, yeah. you know, matter of factly. Some Southeast Asian countries are as well. If you add up South and Southeast Asia, that's two and a half billion people. If they grow at only 5% for the next 10 years, even though they're growing faster than that, but let's just discount it a little bit. If uh, South and Southeast Asia grow at only 5%, in 10 years, they'll be as large as China is today. And yet again, we've been ignoring these countries, you know, for way too long, because it isn't one single market the way China is. But of course, these countries are more open. I mean, you know, they're more, you have better access to them than you do to China. If you look at, you know, the tech sector, for example, the tech sector is, is, has, of course, been shut out of China for the longest time, but it's growing double digits in Southeast Asia. So what I strongly advocate is, that, again, we take a holistic view of Asia, and we don't make it also China centric. What um, if you were at a casino? I'm sorry, this is a terrible question to ask. Uh, I was once on Wall Street, so I think of things in terms of uh, investing. If you were at a casino and you arrayed the Asian countries around the uh, around the, the roulette wheel, if you will, where would where would you be putting your 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 chips, if you will? If you don't mind, that's a horrible question. But where are the uh, economic success stories that we're ignoring? You've just mentioned India, of course, but where else is is surprising now? It's a couple of things. It's uh, next to India in both directions. Uh, Southeast Asia is growing remarkably fast. And um, again, you know, countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines are really finally starting to achieve their potential. On the other side, you've got Pakistan, which is very fast growing also. You know, we think of it as like a terrorist failed state. Uh, but in fact, it's a thriving uh, economy growing very fast. When I talk to retailers, you know, and supply chain operators and so forth. Everyone wants to get into the Pakistan market. It's really, really a great story. Uh, Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan that have been frozen for decades are now have become uh, real centers of growth. That is fascinating. That is really, truly fascinating. And how's Bangladesh? How about the northern? Uh, the northern? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I should have mentioned that, too, uh, you know, is, is really one of the bright spots in emerging markets. And people are raving, you know, about the performance of the textile sector and other areas. And they're really open the economy as well. So, you know, here's the thing. They're growing at different rates, but they're all growing very fast. They're all becoming much more pragmatic in their economic and policy, um, you know, reforming. They're opening to foreign investment. They've been much more cautious about Budget deficits, um, you know, they're attracting record uh, FDI, growing their trade surpluses, moving towards flexible exchange rates. I mean, all the sensible stuff that you need to do, uh, they're doing. So China is obviously the big gorilla. I mean, if I may to return to China, I know the story isn't a China story, but how is China operating in a geopolitical sense there in terms of, um, you know, the United States? And uh, it was the sort of the, 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 the center, the economic geopolitical center of the Euro North American Western, if you want, the thing is China's, I guess, has a role to play in, in the same role to play in, in Asia. How, how are they, you know, operating diplomatically and economically and politically within this quickly expanding? Do they have a, are they treated cautiously or are they treated, I mean, what's their, how does that, how do the other Asian countries relate to China uh, right now? It's a great question. Again, it's a central question in the book. You know, China 
China basically gets what it deserves in this book. It's not 100% of the book. It's like 45% of the book because uh-huh. China is about 45% of Asia's GDP. You know, it's, it's only a one third of its population. So China is very central, but it isn't the whole story. But China is kicking off this next growth wave. You know, as we were saying earlier, you had the kind of Japanese story followed by the tigers, followed by China. And history doesn't end there. You know, now China is the leading investor in the next growth wave in uh, South Central Asia, Southeast Asia. So these countries are benefiting from Chinese infrastructure investment. They're using it to modernize. They're di- diversifying their economies. They're attracting new investment from the rest of the world because the rest of the world sees that China has decided to bet on these countries. And, you know, this is important geopolitically as well, because we tend to look at China's initiative like the Belt and Road as a tool for China to dominate its countries. But in fact, what will happen is that because these countries are gaining more and more confidence, thanks to China, they're also gaining the confidence to resist China. And that is exactly how imperial history works. Mm. Very interesting. You know, I, I've, I've heard, and, and again, you know, I, this book will be a real eye opener for me. I've just seen it comes out in the United States on Monday. So this is very time. Yep. Made. Yeah, on Tuesday. So um, they've been investing. I read that they built a high-speed rail or a bridge in China and a, a, a tunnel in Chile. And what's driving their? I mean, it's all very well to invest in infrastructure in your own in your own country. What's driving this Chinese investment in infrastructure in, in Africa, Latin America, and I assume even more so in Asia? What's what's motivating that for from the Chinese perspective? Well, it's of course it's. It's all about commodities, right? I mean, if you invest in the Chilean infrastructure, that means that you can get, you know, a, a copper and other commodities out of the ground and to the ports faster. And along the way, you may build, you know, a highway or a school. I mean, Chile doesn't need Chinese schools, but African countries do. You know, there are obviously social benefits as well. But more broadly, you know, again, if you look at the growth rates of African economies that have been exporting commodities, minerals, oil, gas, uh, agricultural goods to India and China. They're growing very rapidly because it's not only that they produce this stuff, but they can ship it, transport it faster to far off but fast growing and hungry markets in Asia. So the uh, in fact, part of the book talks about the return of Afro-Eurasia and Afro-Eurasia is the term that in global history we use to talk about the, the era of the pre-colonial world when Africa, Europe and, and, uh, and Asia traded across the Indian Ocean in these kind of new mm. silk roads. Uh, you yeah. know, and it was um, it was a thriving period of of uh, a kind of global economic uh, history. It was a major wave of globalization, in fact. So Afro Eurasia is back in many ways, uh, as I discuss in the book. So again, a lot of that has to do with the fact that China is building uh, this infrastructure that helps those countries participate in global trade much more efficiently. You know, one thing is strikes me as someone who's considered himself, I mean, I, I've been reading The Economist since I was 17 years old. Most of this strikes me as surprising. You know, I've been uh, guilty of ignoring the rise of Asia, the rise of China, certainly the rise of Asia. I mean, what's going to be the cost to Westerners, to Europeans and America, North Americans, to ignoring uh, the messages in your book, as we have been up to date? It strikes me that even policymakers in the United States and Europe still have a very Eurocentric or Western centric view. So what trick are we missing? What's the cost? What's the eventual cost to us? There, there'll be serious commercial, you know, economic consequences because Asia is integrating very rapidly. They're signing lots of trade agreements with each other. Asians trade more with each other than they do with Europe or with America. So if we launch these trade wars, then we wind up cutting ourselves off from their trade with each other. Because that's going to happen. And that's going to mean that our multinational companies are going to have lower revenues. You know, their, their, um, their share prices, their valuations, their market cap are going to fall. So that, that's one very significant consequence of having the wrong policy towards Asia, which is presently what we do have. But again, when I say we, I really only mean Trump's America. You know, I don't mean yeah. Canada. I don't mean the West. Because one of the things that I uh, explain in great detail and length in the book is Europe's attitude towards Asia is very different. Europe is embracing these new Silk Roads. Europe wants the Belt and Road Initiative to flourish. Europe wants to have high-speed railways connecting, you know, Britain and Germany all the way to China because they're the ones who are exporting even more to Asia than we are. So it's critical to realize that we should open our eyes and to see what others are doing more successfully and to learn from them before it's too late. You know, it's funny. We talk about in the United States, if you listen to Bloomberg News or something like that, they say the trade war, I think, is costing 
0.1% right now of GDP per quarter. And the focus is really on the short-term costs of Trump's rhetoric and policy. And policy. But we haven't really thought about the long-term costs. And the long-term costs, I think, if, you, if I can just, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that the adjustments that the rest of the world are making is the United States is a very risky place with whom to do business right now. And, you know, if we need a foothold in North America, well, why not Canada or, or Mexico? So the long-term costs, uh, I think this applies to Brexit equally, is that people will look for other partners who are more sympathetic, less mercantilist, less volatile, more globalist in their outlook. So the United States, from my point of view, risks a, a sort of a real long-term uh, downturn in its economic hegemony, economic and geopolitical hegemony by through these policies, like on a 20 year view, not a quarter by quarter view. Uh, I guess I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that is that a summary that you can make from a conclusion you can make from your from your book? You know, and I, and I do take the view of the five, 10 year, 15, 20 year sort of prism, you know, and in that sense, what you're describing and what, what I said before is perfectly logical and sensible. You know, and if you were to paint a picture based on current trends, that is where it would point you. And even just to, in the North American space, the examples you gave earlier, you do have students saying, you know what, I'd rather go to Canada than America. Tuition is cheaper anyway. Um, you know, you've got auto industry saying, you know what, Mexico is more advantageous than the U.S. and yeah. so forth. So, uh, you know, we, we tend to, again, every country views itself as the center of the world. But when it comes to global supply chains, supply chains are agnostic. You know, supply chains follow the path of least resistance. They don't care for, for you know, sort of our politics. Yeah. And volatile trade policies is obviously a huge business risk. It, it certainly is. And, you know, without getting too technical, what the U.S. is doing with export controls uh, to limit the export of sensitive technologies that country companies like Qualcomm and Intel have to Chinese vendors, you know, it, it, on the one hand, it makes sense because you don't want you want IP protection. Um, but on the other hand, the way we're, we're cutting them off or, you know, what we're doing is basically by politicizing trade. We're giving them an incentive to just get those same sensitive technologies from someone else, which is what they're going to do, because America is not the only country that makes semiconductors, microprocessors and other kinds of chips. You can get them from Japan and Taiwan, South Korea and elsewhere. So their gain will be our loss. And it's funny, I read that eight of the uh, when I was doing my little piece of research on China, eight of the top 20 tech companies in the world are Chinese. And that just blew my mind. Because we think about American technological hegemony as being, you know, irreplaceable source of competitive advantage. But that blew my mind. Oh, um, yeah. And it, it, that, you know, that's the thing. The law of technology diffusion is really the real law of history. You know, it's more powerful than any empire. You know, we get our century in the sun, but the law of technology is always circulating. It never stops. It knows no borders. From China's point of view, they consider themselves to be a sort of a, when did when would China begin to call itself a country? Almost two thousand years ago, is that right? When was when was China? When could you have called a, China a country? A country would be a strong word because it only became you know sort of a modern nation you know of constrained legal sovereign boundaries after its civil war in nineteen forty nine. But obviously, as a civilization with very fluid physical space, but certainly a sense of identity. That goes back thousands of years, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they see, if I understand it from a Chinese perspective, they see the American, China, I think China was the biggest uh, economy in the world in 1800, give or take. And they see the last 200 years of American and Western European uh, hegemony as being just a blip on the horizon. They're about to retake their you know, rightful place at the, as the forerunner of civilization, which is interesting as well, because, of course, we see ourselves as the forerunner of civilization over here. Well, the key thing is that, you know, economics and geopolitics and national identity, you know, they relate to each other, but you really can't use them interchangeably. So, for example, you know, this idea that one country is the center of the world economy, that's not the way global economy works, because it works much more according to networks of relationships rather than within national boundaries. So China is only what China is today because of the fact that Again, not only did Japan and Korea and Taiwan invest in China, but it became the center of the world's factory floor in terms of production. Mm. Uh, you know, China already has a lot of indigenous technology to propel itself. And with such a large population, it will inevitably be the largest economy in the world. But one of the things I explain in the beginning of the book is that the rise of China today as a large economy is not nearly as big a deal as when America was the world's largest economy. Because when America became the world's largest economy, 
in the um, yeah, you know it, yeah exactly in the early 1900s and certainly through World War II, after which it was you know 50 percent of the world economy. That was a really big deal, right? That was a truly uni unipolar world economically. Today, China is has become the world's largest economy, but it's not 50 percent of global GDP. Like not even close, right? China is rising at a time when Europe is still the world's largest economy and America is equally big and now China is really big and other economies are growing very fast. In other words, there's multiple multi-trillion dollar economies in the world. Mm. So just because China is become co-equal with them, it does. it's very, very different from, it's not about replacing America. China's just coming up alongside America and Europe. And that's what we need to understand. So again, a lot of geopolitical conversations are sort of all or nothing. Who's number one? That's not the way right. the world works today. You're going to have five like, people. Kind of like, adoles like adolescent, right? Yeah, because the pie is still growing, right? So you can have many number ones. Well, we're in our, we're in our last, you know, five minutes or so. Or, it strikes me is that one of the things is that there's a, a view, at least in the Western press, that globalization is in retreat. And that's only the case if you live in the United States kingdom or the United States, <laughs> uh, that really the world belongs to the globalists, the people who think in terms of wholes, not parts. Is that one of your conclusions, I suspect? Right. You know, you know, I try to conclude on a hopeful note, a promising, optimistic note uh, about, you know, what I call the fusion of civilizations. And it's picking up really on the last point, just like one doesn't replace the other geopolitically, you know, in the imperial cycle. Similarly, culturally, Asia has learned a lot from Europe, a lot from America. It's all about layers of history rather than, you know, sort of rise and decline and victory and defeat. And I give a lot of examples of that, you know, because um, in Asia today, you have the inheritance of European parliamentary system as you have American pop culture and, and values to some degree. And now you've got a new Asian layer on top of that. And one of the things I advocate is that we now learn a little bit from them. You know, and as you can tell, I would advocate that we have slightly more technocratic governance, you know, far-sighted leadership uh, that's focused on overall welfare rather than just special interests. You know, so I, I believe in you know what I call the fusion of civilizations, not the clash of civilizations. One final question that I'm curious about is a strategic advantage that uh, the United States and the Anglosphere have is we have English. And I'm sure you've thought about this, is to what extent that English is the lingua franca of science and the lingua franca of business and the lingua franca to, to some extent of diplomacy also, to what extent is that confer an advantage that's irreplaceable? Or do you see a future in which, you know, perhaps Mandarin becomes the most, you know, nobody, nobody in the world in the year 2050 grows up without learning Mandarin is no educated person in the world grows up today without learning, without learning English is, you know, what's your, what's your view on that? I'm glad you mentioned it because it is something that I, that I've thought about and written about in this book. And, uh, you know, I do have a view about that and, and the English language is something special, you know, it does confer what you might call an eternal advantage, you know, on, on the U S or on those who speak English, wherever they may be. Anglophone countries, because the world is not going to learn Chinese, to put it simply. The world is going to learn code more than it's going to learn Chinese. Everyone is growing up learning how to code. Not everyone is learning how to speak Mandarin. And Mandarin is really damn hard. It's a lot harder than coding. So <laughs> in terms of what the global languages are, and, and a hat tip to my wife, who, who is a technologist, and she's the one who's really been thinking about this a lot. She says there are two global languages, English and code, and everything else is a distant third. And I've come to the conclusion that she's absolutely right. Oh, fascinating. Fascinating. We're all going to speak Ruby on Rails before we speak. Magic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Python is what my kids uh, code in. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, look, I want to let you get to your lecture. I'm deeply appreciative of that. The book comes out in the United States on Tuesday, the 5th of February. This podcast will come out a little bit after that. And something like that. But congratulations on, you know, yet another really superb looking book. And I can't wait to finish it. And um, I want to wish you the best of luck with everything. Well, I appreciate it. And I'm, again, deeply honored to be a repeat offender uh, on, your, <laughs> on your podcast. So thank you. Yeah, let's stay in touch. Uh, thanks for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you. And in the closing moments of the show, I want to do a couple of things. One is I want to ask you a question. Which topics would you like me to blog more about? Recaps of books I've read, my debunk of the week video series, techniques and tricks for leadership and change management, business-driven how-tos, or 
other topics? What would you like to hear more of from a vlogging perspective? If you've got something, you know, just drop it in the comments or drop it on my website or drop me a personal email. I would love to hear from you. Now, here's a little fun thing we can do. It's often said that there are only seven plot types. I've boiled them down to nine. That's a reverse boiling down. I don't know what that would be called. The seven plot types are Killing the Giant, like Jack and the Beanstalk or Frankenstein, Rags to Riches stories, My Fair Lady and Rocky, The Quest, Lord of the Rings, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, Strange New Worlds, The Chronicles of Narnia, Game of Thrones, Origins and Return Home stories, Ulysses and the Rime of the Ancient Mariner. We have Farce and Irony, A Midsummer's Night Dream, Candide, La Cage aux Folles, Meaning of Life. We have Tragedy, Macbeth, Death of a Salesman, Gladiator, Revenge of the Sith, and we have Rebirth, It's a Wonderful Life, The Search for Spock, well, it's one of my favorites, and Breaking Bad. So what I'd like to know is, if you're using storytelling in business, what businesses do those remind you of? So what businesses would you say have stories that fit into those categories? I'll review the categories for you one more time. Giant Slayers and Monster Killers, Rags to Riches, The Quest, Strange New Worlds, Origin Stories and Return Home, Farce and Irony, Tragedy and Rebirth. I mean, that's a little fun. And if you don't like thinking about things, things, I apologize for the diversion, but thank you. And so once again, my new book, Behaviors and Influence, is going to come out about the 31st of March. I'm very excited about it. Please sign up for early releases on my website, paulgibbons.net. And I want to shout out to my Patreon subscribers. Once again, thank you for supporting the show. It means so much. Talk to you next week. To celebrate the launch of the show, and thank you all for listening, I'm going to be giving away books. Lots and lots of books. All you have to do is leave a review in iTunes. We're going to raffle off a book every single week for 12 weeks. So head on over to paulgibbons.net slash iTunes to get easy-to-follow directions and let me know the title of your review to make sure that you're entered to win. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy to make our world a better place.